Okay, so I think we can start. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. It's uh, great to see you. Uh, we have uh, a new webinar today and we have some uh, great uh, guests uh, from uh, Dutch Railways. Uh, so we'll have uh, today Dennis Hausman and Peter Jan uh, Fiole uh, talking about uh, crew rescheduling at uh, Dutch Railways. So for the ones uh, that you don't know, Dutch Railways are one of the pioneers in using uh, OR and analytics models uh, for uh, tackling railway problems. And uh, Privar, Dennis, and uh, Peter Jan uh, were members of uh, the Dutch uh, Railways uh, team uh, that won the Franz Edelman Award in uh, 2008. So my name is uh, Nikola Beshinovich, and I'm from uh, Delft University of Technology. And uh, the agenda for today is we'll have the presentation for about 35 minutes. After that, uh, we have a Q&A uh, session. So all the questions uh, you may have, uh, feel free to type them in the chat during presentation as well. And uh, I will uh, then uh, read them out to Dennis and Piteyan at the end of the presentation. So we'll have a more discussion. And what we also have for you is after 5 p.m. Uh, local time, we will have a more informal chat. Dennis uh, and uh, probably if you're, Piteyan will be uh, available for uh, some uh, more talk. If So if you are free, feel free to stay a little longer. So I'll uh, give the floor now to Dennis. And uh, yeah. So please, uh, uh, the floor is yours. Yeah, so Nicola, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thanks for inviting us and for introducing us. So my name is uh, Dennis Huisman, part-time working at Rasmus University and part-time at uh, Netherlands Railways. So I will do the first part of this presentation and then we will switch uh, and PT on will do the second part. So before we talk about uh, crew scheduling or crew rescheduling, uh, a little bit of information about the Dutch uh, railway system, uh, which is one of the most densest railway systems uh, in Europe and in the world. Uh, you see here a map of the Netherlands, uh, the main cities, uh, Amsterdam, Rotterdam, The Hague and Utrecht are all in the western part of the country, where there are a lot of train lines. Uh, and of course, uh, yeah, our southern borders are uh, with Belgium and the eastern border with uh, Germany. On the network, we mainly operate passenger trains, uh, so only a limited number of freight trains. And we have a cyclic timetable, which basically means that every hour we operate the same timetable. Uh, and this is the concession to operate all the main lines. Uh, and uh, last year, the government has decided that it will be extended for 10 more years. So that will be extended until 2035. Uh, which is about uh, 40 years from now. Uh, I also put some uh, pre-corona figures because uh, at this moment we hardly have any passengers. But uh, before uh, the crisis in 2019, we had about 1.3 million passenger trips uh, on a working day. And in total, the Dutch people travel about 17 billion, uh, traveled about 17 billion passenger kilometers with an S. And uh, we have about 70 million uh, people. Uh, so that means on average, uh, a Dutch person traveled about 1,000 kilometers uh, with an S uh, in 2019, and that in includes uh, babies and elderly. And this is so, and this is the main operator. We operate on the main lines. There are some small operators who do some uh, regional lines. We have a separate organization uh, responsible for the infrastructure, and that organization is called uh, ProRail. But they play an important role also in this uh, process of uh, rescaling. So I will come back on that later. So first, some general information about crew planning before we look at crew rescheduling. Of course, every train needs a driver. Uh, until we have uh, automatic train operation, uh, we will uh, need a driver on every train to operate it. 
And we also have one or two guards on every train, dependent on, on the length of the train and also uh, on the time of the day. So if we, for instance, look at the driver scheduling, we have about 10,000 tasks uh, on a working day. Uh, and these uh, drivers operate from, you see here 29, but now at the moment 28 crew bases spread over the country. And that basically means that they need to start a working day in their crew base. And after about eight hours, eight or nine hours, they need to end also in their crew base. On the average dirt working day, we have about 900 duties and in the weekend about 700 duties for the drivers. These are the regular duties. And we also have some standby duties, which basically means that the driver or a guard uh, is in principle doing uh, nothing until there is a disruption and he need, uh, there needs to be some rescheduling and then he can be uh, doing some tasks. So here you see some uh, examples uh, of the duties uh, from crew base uh, Rotterdam. Uh, uh, and for instance, uh, the first duty, Rotterdam 10, it starts at 5.32 and uh, finishes at 1.43 in the afternoon. And it consists of several tasks. Uh, and you can see here, uh, because this red line means that all the tasks are on the same train unit. The star is a, is a break and then it will operate some tasks on another train unit. And actually this, tra this duty only has local trains uh, and this, are very unpopular. this would be a very unpopular duty. For instance, the second duty, which is a short one of a little bit less than six hours with a long intercity line, uh, that would be a very popular duty. Uh, and so we have some mix of popular and unpopular duties on every crew base, but that's as a consequence uh, drivers and guards travel throughout the country. So when there is a disruption, you need to take that into account. You also see this uh, yellow task here. Uh, and that means that the driver is just uh, as a passenger in the train. So to reposition him from one place to the other. So a little bit uh, about OR tools that we used uh, at Netherlands Railways also in the past. Uh, so uh, Nicola already told you that we won the Adam Award in 2008. That was basically for the new timetable that went into operation in 2007. And uh, the uh, algorithms that we used for rolling stock and crew scheduling just in the planning phase. Uh, and during the last uh, 10 years, uh, so from 2007 to 2019, I should say, but I skipped in 2020, we had a, a lot of an enormous increase in passenger demand every year, most more or less all time high. And we also had more efficient resource schedules. So by using operations research models, so about 4% in duties and about 6% in one stock uh, kilometers. And that resulted in uh, at that time in the benef annual benefit of 70 million euros. What you also can see here is our operational performance over the years. So from 2005 to 2019, uh, in blue, you see the punctuality uh, figure. Now we measure punctuality in number of passengers arriving on time, but to give you a view on the last 15 years, I only look at the train punctuality at a three minute level, that's the blue line, and the percentage of operated trains, which is the orange line. You see that the orange line is always around 98%, uh, but you see a steady increase of the blue line from 84% uh, in 2005 to about 92% in 2019, uh, which was our all time high. So you see on average every year that we perform better uh, and we are now one of the best uh, performing railway companies in Europe. However, this is a yearly average and in some cases we perform much worse. For instance, uh, also, this year we had some problems when uh, it snowed in the Netherlands and we had some winter weather. And then we got into trouble several times and we had uh, serious disruptions and then you need to do some rescheduling. So to improve our rescheduling process, basically we uh, decided about uh, eight years ago to reschedule, uh, to change our process and to have a new rescheduling process in, uh, in place in the Netherlands. 
and also a completely new organization. Uh, and basically, a very simple schematic view would be that we first reschedule the timetable based on that, the running stock, and then the different crew members, so the drivers and the guards. Uh, and basically, what we also change is that the responsibility of rescheduling the timetable moved from an S to ProRail a few years ago, since that there was only one uh, organization responsible for re rescheduling the timetable. And they do that based on predefined solution, where we make use of the fact that the timetable is cyclic, so every hour the same. So there is a limited number of possibilities and you can generate them beforehand. But for the rolling stock and the crew schedules, of course, the, the schedule is different during the day, as you could have seen in these uh, duties. So there you need some more advanced things. And we decided to start the innovation from the right side, so from the crew side, and then later on do the rolling stock. So our first tools are for real-time uh, rescaling of crew, and that's basically the topic of today's uh, webinar. So then you know where we uh, place, uh, you can place our research and also our in, uh, practical results. Actually, during the years, we developed two algorithms uh, for crew rescaling. Uh, and basically, we, dis we need to distinguish two types of disruptions. Uh, where we have sometimes a large disruption, for instance, a track blockage for several hours so that you cannot operate trains between stations A and B for some hours and you need, that has a, a huge impact on rescheduling uh, the crew. On the other extreme, we have small disruptions where, for instance, only one crew member is absent or there is one cancelled train service and you need to reschedule a little bit that crew member and maybe a few others, but you don't have to reschedule uh, many of them. Of course, uh, the latter situation happens much more frequently than the first one. So the first one is about 800 times a year, so two to three times per day on average, while uh, small disruptions we have many every day. So we developed two different algorithms. So the remainder of the presentation is basically, I will talk about the algorithm for the large disruptions, and then we will switch and Peter Jan will give, uh, he will present uh, the algorithms for the small disruptions. And they're really different algorithms with uh, different techniques. So let me first explain this algorithm for crew rescheduling of uh, large disruptions. Uh, and I will use uh, an example of complete blockage between the sta two stations in the north of the Netherlands, Beile and Hoogeveen, here indicated by this red line. So there are no trains possible uh, between Beile and Hoogeveen. And on this route, there are uh, three different train lines. The green line from The Hague to Groningen in the north here. The blue line from Schiphol Airport to Groningen and the brown line, which is a local train from Zolder to Groningen. And assume that all these lines operate once per hour. So every hour is the same, but they all operate once an hour. So in total, there are three trains an hour between Beile and Hoogveen. So, and then we see here the timetable on the northern part. TN is Groningen. Asse, this is Asse, which is an intercity station, and then we have Beile and Hoogveen here, Meppel and Zwolle. That's on the vertical axis. On the horizontal axis, we have the time, so starting at 5 o'clock in the morning and up to noon. And before the disruption starts, basically, we just see that all the trains uh, just operate like here, the 720, leaving at Groningen and just going to Zwolle. But now at time point T1, there is a disruption between Beile and Hoogveen. For instance, there was uh, no uh, overhead, uh, no electricity anymore, so the trains cannot operate. Then what we see, for instance, this train, the 724, that just left uh, Groningen before the disruption started. And then it comes here in Assen. Uh, and that's the this is an intercity train, and this is the last intercity stop. And of course, it cannot continue because there is a problem. On the south side, we see the same, the 715, 
that's operating here, that cannot go further than Hall of Fame. This is normally not an intercity station, but in the predefined scenario, we say, okay, the, we have this as additional intercity station, and then we turn around. And now basically what you see is that this blue line turns around on this one, which would be the original 724. And on the north side, you see the same, the 724, and turns around on the original 750. You see the similar happen with the green line, and also with the brown line, only the brown line goes here up to the small station Beile. And from there, passengers have to take a bus uh, at the moment that the buses are available. And let's assume now that this disruption will take for three hours. So around 10 o'clock, all the trains operate just normally again. So then, of course, so this is predefined how the timetable will be uh, rescheduled. And then, of course, we have a, the question is, how do we reschedule the crew? Because, for instance, this train driver, which is on train 724 and which is expected to go from Groningen to Zwolle and then further in the country, that's stuck here in Assen. And in Assen, there was nothing to do. The only thing which you can do is go back to Groningen. But then, of course, you need to decide what he will be doing afterwards. And of course, that basically has an effect on the, co the complete remainder of his or her duty. So you need to completely reschedule the duty. So let's have a look and have a, a, a little bit more formal problem description. So for every original duty, we want to find a replacement duty where the goal is to cover as many tasks as possible, because of course we want that all the trains in the new timetable are operated. Uh, preferably, but of course, if that's not possible, we maybe need to cancel an additional train because there is no driver. And if we have a solution where we can cover all tasks, then of course, there is also some difference between the quality of the different solutions. In principle, we don't want to change too much from the original schedule because every change we need to communicate that can something can go wrong. So we try to avoid that. Uh, and finally, we also want, they can use taxis, for instance, to go from over the disruption from one place to the other. Uh, and we try to minimize the use of these taxis, both for the cost of these taxis, but also because of the uncertainty involved. So now let's have a look at the original duty uh, from crew base Groningen. So this original duty starts with train 724. Uh, and not only goes to Zwolle, but even goes further to Amersfoort, which is the next station. Then it will take another train and go to Amsterdam, has a break there and take some other trains. And uh, at the end of the afternoon, we'll be back in Groningen. So this is the original duty, but of course, the first task is changed uh, and basically is changed to a task returning from Groningen to Assen. And then you can only go back to Groningen. So at this moment, the question is, what do you need to do? So a possibility would be to take first a taxi from Groningen to Zwolle, and then you're on the other side of the disruption. You can do some other trains. And at some point here, you take this original uh, part of your original duty and take the task 720, 744. And that would be one possible alternative. Another possible alternative is that you go a few times up and down from Groningen to Assen three times. And when the disruption is over, the 736, if you look here, you can see this is the first train, the 736, operating from Groningen up to the south. You take that one, you have a break in Zwolle, and then do some other task and end with the 9149. And actually, this would be possible because this is just exactly the same train as this one, but then one hour later. Uh, and that's acceptable if the driver is back one hour later in the crew base. Of course, there are many more alternatives and in principle, this grows exponentially in the number of tasks. So to solve this, you need to do something clever. So let's have a look a little bit in more detail. So what kind of constraints do we need to take into account? Uh, of course, all these new duties need to satisfy the labor rules. So there should be a break in every duty the break should be at a location where there is a canteen. Uh, and of course, we need to take into account that at the end of the day, the driver should be back in the crew base and not too much later than originally planned. As I already said, we can use standby duties and tactics, but we try to avoid them as much as possible. 
And the objective is to minimize cancellations and to changes in the crew schedule. And of course, we need to find a solution in a few minutes. So I thought it's also good to have a mathematical formulation on uh, one of the slides. So we have here two types of decision variables. Yi, which is one if a cast task is canceled and zero otherwise. And xk delta is one if we use replacement duty k for the original duty delta. And then of course the main constraints is that every task i has to be either covered in one of the duties or it's cancelled and then the y variable is one. And for every original duty we need to find a replacement duty. And of course this is a huge mathematical program which we need to solve in a few minutes but we have an exponential number of variables. I will not go into the details of the solution approach. We published this uh, about uh, 10 years ago in transportation science. But the main idea, the main part of the algorithm consists of a column generation algorithm combined with a Lagrangian heuristic. But even that, that would be too slow. So we also thought a little bit, do we need all the duties? Do we schedule them? And do we need to consider all the tasks? And of course, for instance, with this example, we had the disruption in the north of the country. And then, of course, a driver who is at that moment of time in the south of the country, it's very unlikely that he will help, that you need to change that duty and that it solves anything. So we only consider a subset of the duties to reschedule. Uh, usually we start with the ones directly involved and only those tasks in the duty. So then we have a core problem. That's what we solve first. And then if we still have uh, uh, basically canceled trains, so trains where we don't find the driver, then we update the set of duties and, and we reschedule again. And this is what we iterate in this way. And we stop, of course, when all trains have a driver or after a certain amount of time, which is usually about three or four minutes. So let's go back to this uh, example. So what, what is the, uh, the solution here? If we use this algorithm, we can compute in 15 seconds uh, a good solution where no trains are canceled and we use two standby duties and no additional duties need to be changed. Of course, this is a relatively simple example. So we also look at a more complex one between Utrecht and Amsterdam, two of the major cities uh, in the Netherlands. And we have there a disruption for three hours and 59 directly affected duties. Then with standby duties, we can find a solution without any cancellations where we need to modify 70 duties the 59 directly affected ones, five other ones, and six standby duties. And we can compute the solution in four minutes. You can also see the results uh, in the next columns. If we don't have standby duties, then we cannot find a solution where uh, there was no cancellation, but also the number of cancellations is quite limited. And this, this is, of course, relevant because maybe during the day, also the standby duties were already used for another disruption uh, at an earlier time. So, of course, we also compare this uh, with manual scheduling before we introduce this in practice. And basically, we saw that uh, we both have an improvement on quality, so less cancelled trains uh, and also less changes in the schedule. Uh, but also an advantage for the drivers because their duties are immediately rescheduled. Uh, and that means that they are sure, uh, of course, until a next disruption happens, that they will and at the end of the day in their crew base. And that's very important for them. So that in, uh, when you schedule, we schedule manually, you only give the next task, but um, if they don't have uh, confidence that they will come back, they will not be very happy with that. What we also should see is that we can compute the solution in a few minutes. Well, if you do it manually, it takes one dispatcher about 10 minutes to reschedule one train. Uh, so that's, of course, we have many dispatches, but still, it takes a long time before you can reschedule such a long disruption. And as a consequence, we have much less risk of getting out of control that we uh, basically are too late with rescheduling uh, and that you have uh, trains without the driver uh, and you get into trouble. So this is basically the point where I want to uh, hand over to uh, PTL. Uh, and he will talk about the other algorithm. By the way, here you see our uh, operational control center where this algorithm is used, the people. 
here on the bottom use that spring. So, Pitian, can you uh, take over and share your screen? I think you will now see the same slide. Uh, yeah. Yeah. But now from my uh, desktop. Um, as Dennis mentioned, this is a picture of our operation control center. Where in the bottom left, uh, where is my mouse? Oh. Here's my mouse. In the bottom left corner is the desk of the uh, the, the crew uh, dispatching personnel. Where I think on this screen, actually, the system where these algorithms are implemented uh, is is on. You can see it. You can only see the reflection of some light, but uh, you'll have to believe me. Um, all right, as Dennis uh, ended his talk uh, by saying how great this uh, solver works for loss, uh, large disruptions and it outperforms uh, manual dispatching uh, by a lot, um, that doesn't hold for uh, small disruptions. And I, uh, I will start with a, a slide with results. And here we uh, devise 10 cases of a small disruption. And this small disruption uh, consists of a single unplanned task. For example, here, the task from Daventer to Amersfoort doesn't have a driver and it should have a driver. So the disruption is to, to the problem is to get a driver for this task. And in this column, uh, the solver results for the large uh, solver are shown. And as you can see, uh, only in two cases, uh, this solver was able to actually come up with a solution and eight cases it uh, calculated a lot but didn't end up with any solution and sometimes it it what it ran for four to five minutes without ever uh, ending up with a with the solution um so on the one hand it worked very good for large disruptions but this also has um uh, had a problem with um, acceptance uh, from the dispatchers. Uh, there was a feeling um, if this solver can solve trivial problems, how can I ever trust it will solve difficult problems? Um, well, it does, but there there was a, an acceptance issue uh, there. And in this column, uh, there are the results of our uh, solver for smaller disruptions. And as you can see, uh, the, the heuristic calculation time is at most two seconds. That's actually the, the calculation cutoff time we used. And in those two cases, it wasn't able to find a solution. But in all other cases, uh, it came up with a solution. Uh, the two cases where the large solver found a solution, this solver finds actually the same solution in, well, zero seconds. We were really struggling to measure the calculation time. Um, so here you already see we um, it, this this solver performs much much better on on smaller uh, on smaller problems. Um, and and why is that? Well, this large scale solver assumes there's a a turning pattern at the end of the uh, at both ends of the disruption. And in smaller disruptions, this turning pattern doesn't exist. So this solver tries to find it, but because it doesn't exist, you can't take advantage of it. Um, well, first, what do we mean with uh, a smaller disruption? As I mentioned, we start with a single unplanned task. And uh, the problem is that we have to plan this unplanned task in any of the current duties. So the first step is we move this unplanned task into an existing uh, old duty. And that means this old duty, uh, we have to remove some tasks. For example, to fit this task into this duty, this one, uh, we have to um, remove this task. If we do that, then this unplanned task is in the duty, but it has um, place conflicts uh, at both sides of the new task. This task ends in waste and has to start in Amsterdam. Fortunately, we can add uh, a positioning trip in between. So that the driver uh, travels as a passenger uh, on this train uh, from base to Amsterdam, and then he's able to, uh, to drive this previously unplanned task. 
Um, on the other side, we're not so lucky. It's not possible to travel from Utrecht to Amersfoort within this time span. So the next step is to remove another task. We remove this task from the duty and then we don't have to send them as a passenger anywhere because this task ends in Utrecht and this one starts in Utrecht. So we had to remove two tasks from the old duty. One of the tasks already was a passenger positioning trip. So we don't have to replan this one, but this uh, will be a new unplanned task. So to, to, plan, to plan this unplanned task in this duty, we will result in a new unplanned task. And we're pretty happy because this unplanned task starts later in time. So um, actually, if we do this, we buy some time to solve the problem. Um, and this is a ta task insertion mechanism we have to try um, basically for every duty in order to find uh, a solution. We, we have to do the same thing for this unplanned task. And um, uh, we do that this in a way uh, which results in basically in a, in a large search tree. Um, all right, uh, but fully ex exploring this search tree um, uh, is very difficult. So we start with a, a sanity, sanity check. And that basically means we measure beforehand if we will be um, uh, the completely, if something is impossible, it, it's in a lot of cases, um, you can detect that on a very early stage. Because for example, if the unplanned task starts in Amsterdam and there's a driver currently in Groningen, well, we know it takes at least one and a half hour to get from Groningen to Rotterdam. And if this unplanned task starts in 15 minutes, then we don't, we can save the time trying. We will know we will fail. We cannot uh, insert this unplanned task in this duty. Um, same thing if an old, if this duty um, is already finished. So if the unplanned task is in the afternoon, we don't have to try uh, duties from the morning and vice versa. Um, so that, that's what we do first, that which we call uh, some kind of sanity check. Um, <coughs> after that, um, the solution approach basically um, is implemented as a tree search with some uh, branch and bound uh, mechanism. Um, our um, objective value um, is uh, strictly increasing. So we know the further, the deeper we go in the tree, the objective value uh, will only increase, which uh, provides us with opportunity to cut a part of the trees based on, uh, on already found solutions, which can uh, act as upper bounds. Um, we implement that first uh, search with iterative deepening. Um, so we start, we implement that first search, which we start with a maximum depth of one. So basically that means we explore the first layer of the tree completely um, at the beginning of the uh, of the search uh, tree, and that has some advantages. Uh, I will explain uh, later. Uh, and thirdly, we have implemented a priority system to determine which duties we will try first. And I will try to explain something from this priority system uh, in the in the following slides. Um, well, what we what do we do? We um, introduced a priority value or, predi or prediction value. Um, we use both terms. It's both PV. Um, so this priority value is basically uh, the objective value plus one million if it's impossible uh, to implement to insert a task in the duty. Um, so it's either one million if task insertion is, is not possible, and if task insertion is possible, uh, then it's the objective value of the task insertion. Um, so that's the, the actual uh, priority value. And what we do beforehand, before the actual task insertion, we uh, calculate a predicted uh, priority value. Um, and this predicted priority value is based on some characteristics of the duty we are going to implement the implant task in. And 
uh, the constant and the beta values um, are determined based on regression analysis. Analysis. So we tried this task insertion um, over half a million times. We calculated the resulting objective value, and we we did a regression analysis to come up with this uh, beta values. And basically, there are I think somewhere around ten characteristics we calculate for each duty, and based on that, we calculate the predicted priority value. So, for example. One of the characteristics is, is this driver in the departure station of the unplanned task? And if this is true, this reduces the priority value, the predicted priority value with a quarter of a million. Uh, and if it's not true, then uh, it reduces it by nothing. So a lower priority value means we are, this duty is more likely to be helpful in the solution. <laughs> and this makes sense. Because if the driver um, is in the departure station of the unplanned task within an hour of the start of the unplanned task, well, then at least he was at the station at some time, so he'll probably be close. So if that's the case, he, you can um, you can see that he's more likely to be able to uh, perform this unplanned task. Uh, so in this case. In this way, we calculate a predicted priority value. The lower the value, the, the more likely the driver is to, uh, to perform this unplanned task. All right. Um, and if we do that, then this is the uh, uh, probability density function <coughs> of this predicted priority value. You can see here. With a priority value, predicted priority value of around 400,000, the likelihood that this unplanned task um, can be inserted in a duty is almost 100%. It's 98% or something. And the higher the priority value, if the priority value, the estimated priority value is over a million, then we're almost certain that this task cannot be inserted in a duty. Um, so basically, we cut it off at a million. And you see here some bump um, that can be explained um, by um, the effect of the combination of some characteristics. So this function um, measures the characteristics by, by themselves, but maybe uh, some characteristics um, have an effect in combination of each other. And that results in this bump. Um, and basically, we didn't really uh, investigate which characteristic um, uh, create this bump. We just say, OK, we assume that this is true, and we're going to order uh, uh, the duties uh, by the probability of their priority value. So first, we're going to do this group. And then when we reach this value, we're going to do the values of around 800,000 first, and then around 700,000 after that. Um, and by doing this, um, we will find solutions very, very quickly, much, much more quickly uh, than if we uh, did, if we would have done it without this uh, priority value. Um, so how this, um, just an idea of how this works. Um, approx approximately 1,200 duties exist for any given unplanned task. And this, these are all the duties of a day. So if the unplanned task is in the afternoon, this includes the duties in the morning. Um, and on average, about 125 duties survive the first sanity check. Um, and for those 125 duties, we uh, calculate the uh, priority value. And then about 100 duties pass the priority value uh, system. So in other words, around 25 of them have an estimated priority value of over a million. So we ignore those as well. Oh. And then on average, 
out of those 100 duties, on average, 20 duties would pass the actual task insertion. And thanks to what this priority system, we almost never actually have to try the task insertion algorithm for the other 80 duties. So we are able to um, come up with a sortation of those 100 duties where the duties where we are successful in task insertion um, uh, come up at the front of the priority row. And when we do that, we find uh, solutions very quickly, and then we can prune the search tree based on those solutions we find and uh, evolve into a very good solution very, very quickly. Um, and then in the end, on average, only one duty results in an actual solution, one or two. Um, and this is a graph where these results are shown. Uh, the blue line is um, the first solution, so, and the, the dotted line is the, the best solution. So after two seconds in our prototype, <coughs> in almost 78% um, almost of the cases, we have found the best solution. Uh, so that means in 22% of the cases, we didn't find any solution yet. Um, but in the, uh, in the other cases, we do uh, within uh, two seconds. And in practice, um, this means that trivial solutions are found very, very quickly when they exist. Um, and that's what I meant by doing uh, this depth first search with uh, iterative deepening. Um, by exploring the first layer of the search tree uh, completely uh, first, um, you guarantee that trivial solutions are found within the two seconds. So if you just can plan the unplanned task by using a, a driver that's already a passenger on this train, um, you are guaranteed to find this solution and you can rely on if, if such a trivial, trivial solution exists, you will, you will find it. Um, more complex solutions are often accepted by dispatchers. Um, I would say most of the times, not always, but most of the time. Um, and in the 22% of the cases that no solution is found by the algorithm or a solution is not accepted by a dispatcher, um, the system still gives information to the dispatcher, namely that the really trivial solutions do not exist. So, even the, the, the simple solutions for a dispatcher to um, explore this and, and, and look for that, it will take time. And by re relying on this system that if it didn't find the solution, then it doesn't exist, it can skip the, uh, the time, uh, the, the efforts to start looking for that by himself. So if there's no solution found, this means the dispatcher to consider more creative solutions immediately and you can skip looking for the easy solution. So uh, more creative solutions means um, solutions outside the limitations uh, that the solver had. For example, um, uh, can I implement a solution where the meal break is one minute shorter than the limits or uh, things like that by violating some, uh, some rules that, uh, that this solver uh, was not allowed to violate. So even when no solution is found, is found by this algorithm, it still helps the dispatcher looking for um, uh, looking for the the solution in the end. Um, so um, to conclude uh, our uh, talk, um, advanced operations research methods can be very helpful in the uh, crew rescheduling. Um, well, both algorithms uh, Dennis and I discussed are actually uh, implemented in the real life uh, dispatching world of an S. And what we've shown is that different types of disruptions need uh, different algorithms. Um, well, what works for large disruptions didn't seem to work at all for small disruptions and vice versa. So both different systems are implemented, um, well, basically in the same uh, dispatching system. And uh, well, 
finally, at NS, algorithms for crew risk scheduling are now part of everyday life of, of crew uh, dispatchers. It's, it's very common that dispatchers use these systems. Um, they're very uh, easy to use. For example, the, the algorithm for small disruptions, it's really two mouse clicks and you'll wait a couple of seconds and you'll uh, get a, a, a proposed solution for this unplanned task. And they'll use it um, on a daily basis, on an hourly basis. Well, they use it all the time. Um, so thank you for your attention. And if there are any questions, I think both Dennis and I are happy to, uh, to comment on that. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Dennis and Pideon, for uh... A uh, super interesting presentation. We got already several questions. So we can start uh, with uh, we have a few questions uh, for Dennis. So at the very beginning, so a question from uh, Christian Liebchen. I uh, mentioned that you have uh, about a 6% reduction in train unit kilometers. Uh, and uh, yeah, hoping that the share of empty mileage has not been as high as 6% uh, beforehand. Uh, could you explain what are the main sources of the reduction? Okay, so that, that was about rolling stock uh, scaling, which was of course not part of this uh, of this talk. Yeah, so we but of course it's not, uh, it was not about empty uh, mileage, but it just about uh, that, let's say, of course you, uh, you can make longer trains or shorter trains, and if you have a limited demand, you shouldn't have uh, a train with a lot of capacity. So this is mainly a more efficient rolling stock scheduling. Uh, yeah, reduced the kilometers uh, of, of the total rolling stock. Yeah, okay, great. Then uh, another one, uh, when you talked about uh, yeah, the example on a large disruption and uh, mentioning one of uh, three hours long, uh, how do you deal with uncertainty of the actual duration? Could you say something about it? Yeah, no, that, that's indeed a very good question because that's of course uh, always a problem because these, these algorithms are deterministic. So they assume a deterministic duration uh, of the disruption. Uh, and it depends a little bit on the type of disruption if you can get a good prediction. So what they usually do is you assume a certain duration. And of course, when it takes longer, that's not really a problem because you see it as a new disruption. And, and then you handle that one. Actually, we developed a little bit more sophisticated alg uh, algorithms to, to take some of this robustness and uncertainty into account. But to be honest, uh, we published a nice paper about it, but they are not, uh, that algorithm is not uh, used in practice. So it's used in uh, assuming basically a, 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 a fixed duration. And uh, when the, this duration is longer, then uh, you reschedule again. That's basically how they do it in practice. Of course, when the duration is shorter, then uh, yeah, in some sense, that's good luck, but also bad luck because then we don't change it anymore. <laughs> So if uh, it uh, becomes a uh, short term all of a sudden, uh, it will uh, stay with a plan yeah. uh, that yeah. has been computed. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, thanks a lot. Then uh, uh, the next uh, question uh, is uh, uh, on the, the other side. So for Peter Jan, so you talk about uh, the performance of the algorithm and uh, at some point you narrow down to 20 duties uh, passing a task insertion. And then uh, the question is that, does it mean that uh, uh, about uh, 15, 20% of uh, duties feature uh, larger idle times, assuming that uh, inserting uh, tasks could be done only when uh, uh, during these idle times? Um, I hope it's clear. If not, yeah. Not really. Um, um, oh, you will see still. Well, maybe we can have uh, Christian as well uh, to uh, elaborate a bit on the question. 
Yes, of course. Uh, thank you very much, Nicola, and also thank you very much for the presentations of uh, Dennis and Peter Jan. Um, you, you, you mentioned some statistics uh, when uh, how, how many duties pass which uh, level of the test, right? Mm, this one? This one, yes, indeed. So, and so uh, out of the candidates uh, which passed the sanity check, then uh, about 15 to 20 percent of the duties seem to allow to insert some task that is uh, now to, to, to be rescheduled. And so if uh, I can insert a task into an existing duty, at least I assume that the duty beforehand must have had idle time such that the uh, task to be inserted is not in conflict with any task that has been scheduled yep. before. No, so uh, this would mean to me, or this would translate to me that there are plenty of idle times in the duties, which is uh, something which I might not have expected uh, no, it, after I, I the it, optimization algorithms for the queue schedule for the plan. I think it's more or less the other way around. Um, there are quite a lot of duties that you can actually insert this unplanned task by completely deleting the, all the tasks that are currently in the duty. So then basically the answer is yes, you can insert this task, but then you, instead of one unplanned task, you will have 10 unplanned tasks. So that's the answer is yes, it is possible to, to allow this unplanned task, but it's not, uh, it's not a good idea. Okay, then um, I, was just, I was just misled by the word inserting because yeah, I was not uh, expecting that anything bit, at the very yeah. end is then to be skipped. Thank so you very much for that. That's a little bit I, I didn't really explain. So out of the, those 80, there are a lot that you can insert this task, but it leads to very bad solutions. And thanks to the priority system, um, those end up very low uh, in ranking and you'll never have to try it because you already found a good solution. Yeah. Great, thanks a lot. Uh, then I uh, have a, a question that uh, relates uh, to drivers and maybe in both uh, cases. Uh, so it may happen that a driver for various reasons uh, reject uh, the adjusted uh, or rescheduled uh, task. So how, how do you deal with that? And what is uh, the percentage of uh, accepting uh, the tasks? So the, what does it mean for the algorithm? Would you then run it again? How often does it happen? Could you say something about it? Do you take that one, uh, PTO? Yeah. Yes, are you going to answer or? Uh, that's also <laughs> fine. <laughs> oh, sorry. Uh, now, of course, this is an issue. Uh, of course, the acceptance of the of the drivers the, the, and the guards that that took that took uh, some years uh, to get them uh, also accept uh, these changes. Of course, in the first hand, we of course we take all kind of rules into account in these algorithms, and we don't. Uh, yeah, the algorithm has to satisfy these rules. That's also, by the way, uh, why you sometimes can find as manual dispatcher a better solution than the algorithm because then they can try to violate those rules and call the drivers if they accept it. In principle, they need to accept it when it uh, satisfies all the rules. But of course, sometimes maybe there is a very good reason which the algorithm doesn't know why it's still not possible. Uh, of course, when there was a large disruption and you had 50, uh, for instance, 50 duties changed and that, that for one uh, duty that's not accepted, then you could consider that as a new disruption of let's say a small disruption. For the small disruption algorithms, uh, then you need to find uh, another solution. Maybe the, the next solution would be a good one. Of course, we try to avoid this as much as possible also because the communication of the new duties to the drivers goes automatically. So they get a message with the new duty uh, on the smartphone. So, and, and, they need, and then they need to accept or not. Uh, but the idea is of course that, uh, that they accept it. Uh, but there have been quite some discussions with the unions uh, during the last uh, couple of years, not, not the last couple of years, but when we introduced it in the, let's say a few years ago, 
Uh, and then, uh, of course, the, to convince them that it's also good for them. Uh, because let's say for the whole population, it's good. Uh, but sometimes individually, you maybe get uh, a new duty, which is not the most uh, preferred one. Yeah. So does okay. that answer the question? Yeah, and uh, maybe just a bit, uh, what uh, would a uh, uh, dispatch or a controller do in that case? If uh, there is a rejected uh, yeah, when there is a rejected, first call them, of course. And, and by the way, also when there is not an accept, because maybe they haven't seen it, or uh, so then they try to call them and convince them. But maybe there is a very good reason, uh, which we don't know, uh, uh, a, a private reason. And then, then we need to uh, change the solution, of course. But then preferably only for that particular drive. Okay, clear. Uh, so then uh, about uh, task uh, insertion, so for Peter Yan, so you mentioned uh, uh, to use uh, predicted expected priority, and you mentioned uh, you have a set of uh, characteristics or predictors uh, in the regression model. Could you maybe highlight uh, the more important ones, the more interesting ones uh, to be considered? Um, well, there are, um, most of them are quite obvious. Uh, for example, idle time um, is a, a very important one. Um, if, if you have some duty that is basically empty in this time period, then that probably is a very good candidate to solve this unplanned task. So if you have a lot of idle time in the duty, then the priority value drops by a lot. So there's a characteristic uh, percentage of idle time. Um, there's a characteristic, does it have uh, a task overlapping the current unplanned task? Because um, if it does not, then you will have a chance um, that this will be the final solution without a new unplanned task. And if you have a current overlapping task, then you are um, a priori certain that you will, even after task insertion, you will end up with a new unplanned task. Um, so those kind of characteristics are, are implemented, and there are, um, well, the, the the example I gave um, is the drive has the driver been in the departure station? So in this case, has it, has the driver been in Amsterdam in the last hour? Um, but also, has he been in Utrecht in the last hour? So those are um, characteristics. Um, well, quite intuitive char characteristics, I would say. Um, uh, to, to make this uh, a good or a bad candidate. Uh, so if the driver has been in the neighborhood of this unplanned task or not, if he, if he has been at the complete opposite part of the country, then probably it will be difficult to uh, incorporate this driver in a very good solution. Um, and there are some other uh, characteristics, but I think those are the most important ones. Okay, thanks. Then I uh, have a question from uh, Stefano Riepi uh, from uh, the US NS, uh, so freight operator, and uh, it's more related uh, to flexibility of uh, the approaches uh, you develop. So would they, be, would they be applicable to freight railways where we have uh, more variability in uh, schedules? Uh, and uh, do you see any potential? Would you go for uh, developing uh, your algorithms or would you actually suggest uh, looking for something else? No, maybe uh, I think that as what we have seen, so some, some different types of disruptions also so need some different algorithms. So I can imagine that uh, at a freight operator which has a completely different structure, you need some differences also in the algorithms of course i think you can use some of the main ideas uh, that we use in these algorithms also for another setting but i think you need really need to fine-tune uh, it so probably you can reuse it partly but you also need to change it partly okay okay thanks uh so maybe uh one uh, question uh, to uh, start uh, closing down, also given uh, the time. Uh, 
So we have been seeing these developments uh, so far. So looking at the future, uh, which direction would you then recommend to someone uh, developing or starting to, doing re to do research in uh, cruise scheduling or rescheduling? Where would you put, suggest uh, putting focus on? Oh, that's a good question because I think you can do a lot of things. So uh, both from a research perspective and from a practical perspective. I think from a research perspective, of, I think a very interesting aspect is the uncertainty aspect of disruptions and the dynamic flow of information. Uh, so here, of course, especially the first algorithm is very dependent that you have a good prediction of the duration of the uh, disruption uh, and that you have the information available uh, on the timetable and on the rolling stock schedule. Uh, and of course, that is not always the case in practice. So we also do some research. We have a, a research project uh, we, uh, fun, funded by the Dutch Research uh, Council. You also included in that, uh, Nicola, where we look at uh, much more dynamic situations and much more uncertain situations, uh, how you need to deal with that. And I think that's a, a real challenge, uh, not only for crew, but also for crew. Yeah, and on a practical side, uh, the current focus we have on the dispatching is uh, basically rolling stock dispatching, because on crew dispatching we have uh, now these very nice uh, algorithms in place, uh, but for rolling stock uh, dispatching, um, not so much. So I think our focus is uh, is more uh, going towards that instead of uh, crew dispatching improvement in the current crew dispatching algorithm. Okay, and uh, well, what about new mathematical, uh, well, new uh, approaches like uh, machine learning? Uh, do you see that uh, uh, happening and uh, being uh, integrated uh, in the models, whether substituting uh, OR or supporting and uh, about uh, available data? So Dennis is also at the university, so you develop a lot. So in the world of uh, sharing data and uh, supporting uh, research. Uh, some people notice that on your web pages, you actually do not have much. And is that something that we could expect uh, in, the, in the future? Uh, now, maybe to start with the last uh, question uh, on the data availability uh, for researchers. So, uh, we need to have a look at it. You can always contact me, but uh, especially for crew rescheduling, we need to take into account uh, at the moment some uh, privacy concerns, especially about the crew members. So we need to anonymize uh, uh, all the all the data. That's that's at least important because otherwise we violate some uh, European laws. Uh, so uh, that that's always a tricky uh, thing, and of course you need a lot of data uh, to to develop these uh, algorithms and to run them. So th th we need to be careful with that. And then maybe, uh, Peter, Jan, do you want to say something about uh, machine learning? Um, yeah, actually in the early phase of this um, uh, crew dispatching uh, research, we tried a multi-agent system. Um, and we actually uh, came up with some pretty good results on that. Um, I think comparable uh, in performance, comparable to the results, uh, the algorithm we implemented in the end uh, discussed by Dennis. Um, but well, it, it was at, at the time because the results were comparable and not better that we chose to uh, for this approach in, instead of the multi-agent approach. Um, but um, back then we tr we tried it uh, we did try it and it's not really machine learning but multi agent approach well it, it goes into that direction um, I think for the uh, the crew dispatching algorithms as as it stands now well basically what I said uh, on the earlier question um, from a practical point of view, we are satisfied with the performance of what we have now. So there's no real need to 
try to really improve on that. Um, although um, we did have an idea, for example, for the, the algorithm on uh, small disruptions um, uh, to, uh, to add a, a learning mechanism in the, this priority system. We have now a, a static uh, regression analysis, analysis um, and you could imp implement uh, a more dynamic self-learning uh, regression mechanism and that overnight uh, adjusts those uh, better parameters for each characteristic. Um, but, well, that we, that's an idea we have, but we never, there was ne never an urgency to really implement that because the static version works fine. And well, in, in a practical way, that was really the argument, I would say. And um, does that answer uh, the question? So there are some thoughts, but um, they never made it to the practical implementation. Yeah, I, I think it's a good one, but yeah, th there may be some uh, thoughts uh, further on. Uh, okay, so uh, I would like uh, to thank uh, Dennis and uh, Peter Jan for great uh, presentation and thank you all for a uh, fruitful discussion. So with this, I would like to close the formal uh, part of uh, this webinar. So we'll have uh, Dennis and Peter Jan available uh, for some uh, more talks. So uh, there were still uh, questions unanswered. So feel free to bring them up uh, now and feel free to join uh, the discussion. Thank you so much. And then uh, see you in uh, a month uh, time. Take care all.